Welcome back to your live continuing coverage of Toy Fair 2015. This is your official Toy Fair coverage with the Toy Industry Association. I'm Michael Artsis and you're watching Be Terrific. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget you can join our chat room. You're going to want to do it for this one. I mean, this is an exciting one. We've got some of the staff. I won't let them ask questions beforehand. I'm literally like, hit the chat room because we can't spill any information beforehand. But here it is. The chat room is beterrific.com slash live, go underneath the live video player. There is a chat room, it's an IRC, join anonymously or create a login so you can come back often. I'm checking it throughout the interview, I'm looking at it right now. Ben is saying, I've got to ask all these important questions. You guys come in here, ask these questions. This gentleman is Tom Kalinske. So awesome to have you here. It's great to be with you. And, and so the thing is, you started your career with, uh, you did He-Man, right, in the beginning. Well, actually, I started well, even my career you were at Mattel. Before that, at Mattel, I was right? part of reviving Barbie back in really? the early '70s. Yeah. Reviving Barbie—it's hard to imagine Barbie needed to be revived. <laughs> How do you do that? Did you have to do CPR on Barbie or what? Uh, well, it, it was—it was hard. I mean, yeah. the the founder of Mattel, Ruth Handler, walked into my cubicle, which was right outside the ladies' room, it was very conveniently located one day. Yeah. And she said, "Tom, Barbie had its first decline in sales ever. Sales fell all the way to forty-three million dollars." The sales <laughs> fell all the way to 43. The in the 70s, the sales force says it's over. A lot. The Wall Street analysts say it's over. The retail buyers say it's over. What do you think about that? I said, Ruth, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. Yeah. She said, that's what I wanted to hear. You're now the marketing director on Barbie. Wow, <laughs> really? That's <laughs> yeah. an amazing answer yeah. and story. And yeah. so you're the marketing director then, and what happens? Well, I, th in those days, they only introduced one Barbie a year and one line of costumes and one accessory. And I said, this is crazy. Let's, let's build the brand. Let's do lots of different Barbies. Let's do a Barbie for young girls. Let's do a Barbie for older girls. Let's do occupation Barbies. Let's do sure. astronaut Barbie. Let's do president Barbie. Let's do doctor Barbie. And Genius. let's do high end Barbie. Let's do Oscar de la Renta design costumes on Barbie and sell them for $100. Genius. So we segmented the market and the business took off and it grew to like $550 million. Ding, ding, ding. I mean, genius. And so here's the thing. Uh, I even, as a boy who completely rejected girls, uh, it, dolls I mean, sorry, <laughs> not girls, I love, love girls, uh, it, dolls, my uh, mother tried to force Barbie on me and I never would, would want to play with it. But I will tell you that when I saw the, the girls that I would ha have as friends that were young, when we were young, I always thought that the, the beach Barbie with the Jeep was probably your creation or your idea. I always thought that looked fun. I never wanted to get involved in it, but always thought it looked fun. You know, uh, the, the camper yeah. and the Jeep and the Ferrari were two yeah. great accessories yeah. for, for Barbie. Everybody loved those. All, all right, so then uh, you, you move on and you're now, how do you get to He-Man? Because okay, I, there were two shows yeah. I loved, and I'm going to yeah. tell you a quick story. There was um, Thundercats yes. and He-Man. Yes. And um, I was a big He-Man guy. And uh, so I remember walking around the mall around the holiday time with my family and uh, to distract me so that I wouldn't see the gifts they were getting me, because uh, we're, I guess that was the lack of planning my family had, that uh, they were buying the gifts with me there at the mall. Um, and so literally, they'd be like, oh, He-Man's over there, and somebody would take me, I just saw He-Man, he's here, and they would, I was so excited, they'd literally take me to that part of the mall to go find He-Man, and then th this person would go buy a gift, and then we'd switch, and I'd go with somebody else to find He-Man, because that person had just seen He-Man over at this part of the mall, and I'd get so excited, and I'd run and, and, and tear down the mall, and then they'd go and buy, you know, whatever. Yeah. Glad to have that impact on your life. Y you did, yeah. yeah. So he, I am, he I man. have the power. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, it's such yeah. a great show. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and a great action figures, I had the action figures. Yeah. Well the action figures came first. Yeah. We did this all this research, because remember in those days, Mattel didn't have a, an action figure line. Hasbro sure. had Star Wars and G.I. Joe. We didn't have anything. So we did all this research. Should we do DC characters? Should we do Marvel characters? Should we do astronauts? Should we do policemen? Should we do this heroic, muscular character with his adversary, Skeletor? And that won in the research. So my team, which was brilliant guys, said we got to do we got to do He-Man. And, and everybody thought we were nuts because it wasn't a licensed or a TV show. But we did it. We did 75 million in, in revenue. Skeletor. Skeletor, I mean, uh, to you me, remember? That is, uh, villain-wise, that's a hard villain to sell at that point, I think. 
but he was so bad, the boys wanted him to no, no, so no, they'd but have I mean, somebody like, to compete When you're with. in those meetings, they're like, yeah, yeah. he man needs yeah. somebody a little less, yeah. a little softer, right? Yeah. Didn't they need a little, didn't, 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 that, didn't that happen? It was controversial. Yeah. And Castle Grayskull was controversial because it was seen as a, you know, a scary negative place. That's what I'm place. saying. It's like, yeah. it, you ha I could imagine sitting in those meetings and trying to sell Skeletor. I'm talking, you didn't have a TV show. You're no, saying, this is going to be amazing. And, okay, so who's the villain? Oh, it's this guy, Skeletor. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we could go Pretty for like, uh, how about the Iron Sheik, which wasn't out <laughs> yet. But I mean, like, uh, you're, I'm thinking like they're they're like, yeah, maybe we could find. But maybe Darth Vader even paved the way for that yet. Well, certainly, because Darth Vader was awfully scary. Right. He was to, yeah. to young boys. All right, so then you get them to do He Man, and you do so well, and then they say. We the, the, the chairman walks in my office one day and says, well, it's great you made this a successful toy line, but it really won't be big like Star Wars is because you don't have a TV show and you can't get one. I said, you want to bet? And so we did a deal with Filmation and Group W. We each put up three and a half million dollars. Wow. We produced 65 half hour episodes, which had a moral message at the end of each show. You probably remember yep, that. Yeah, I remember this, yeah. And we gave it away free to stations across the United States, syndication deal. They gave us back three 30 second commercials which we either use, we couldn't use them for He-Man, but we'd sure. use them for other products, or we sold them to McDonald's or to a shoe company or to Kellogg's or whatever. Well, the show was so successful, we made a profit off the, off the television show, and the revenue of the toy line grew to $750 million. This is genius. I mean, what people don't realize is that you gave the show away for free. Yeah. And yeah. you got back the money in advertising. Yeah. But, I mean, like, to do that back then, it was the first time it was yeah. done by a toy company. Yeah, unbelievable. And you became the ad agency, basically. Well, we, or, we, we or ended a media up, buyer. We ended up selling a lot of right, media. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Okay, and now you've made He-Man a success, right. both on television and uh, the figures. Right. And then what? Well, we did a movie with Dolph Lundgren too. What was that movie? He-Man. I don't remember that movie. That's probably good that you don't remember that movie. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> the TV show was a so lot So he was He-Man? Yeah. Dolph was the uh, bad guy in no, Rocky V. Oh, yeah. But yeah. He was He-Man. Was he yes, I must uh, break you. Yeah, I don't yeah. think he looked enough Ivan like Drago. me. You know, he, he didn't look enough like what? <laughs> me. Yeah, you were the model for He-Man, <laughs> right? I should have been, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, now you, I didn't know you guys had a movie. How did I miss the movie? I don't know. It didn't last long, I guess, in the theaters. It's probably the it answer It was not a success? That. Are you serious about that? It wasn't a, It wasn't. Did you? Successful. It's because you didn't give it away for free. Maybe. maybe you know, that wouldn't have been a bad idea. You give the tickets away yeah. for free, give it to the theaters for free so they can get it. They make the money off the concessions, which is what they make money off of anyway. And you guys make the money off, throw some advertising, product well, placement, right well, in the middle of the movie. It, and we did the touring show, yeah. like like the Disney that I remember, shows. Yeah, and and that was the m one of the most successful touring shows for a boys' property ever. Yeah. I mean, it lasted for years. I remember watching uh, those commercials for that in between and wanting to go see that. I never did, but in between the monster truck commercials, yeah. were, you know, <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, so now we get to the real stuff. Uh, right. Ben remembers the movie, by the way. He's one of f five people that actually liked it. He's in the chat room, the IRC chat room. Good. Now we get to consoles and yes. the console wars. Now you're the author of console wars. No. No. Yeah. Blake Harris is the author of He's Console the author, Wars. I'm sorry. It's about the time period where I was CEO of Sega that in 1990 and I'm sorry. I, I, I remember that and, and messed that up on you. I'm sorry. But there's a great book called Console Wars. Everybody's yes. got to check out. And you, it's about your time period in, in the 80s. Uh, yes, in 90s. In 90s with Sega. So right. now, you're, now how do you get to Sega from Mattel? Well, I had done something in between called yeah. Matchbox uh, Toys. Oh yeah, something anyway, small. I, yeah, I never yeah. heard of them before. But, but anyway, I, got, I had gotten to know when I was at Mattel, the, yeah. the, the CEO and chairman of, of Sega, because yeah. they did arcade games in those days, sure. and at Mattel we were looking for licenses. It was like a Barbie game, wasn't there? There was, and, yeah. and, so, and so I knew this guy. And he kept asking me to come work at Sega, and I kept turning him down. Yeah. And I was on vacation in Hawaii, and all of a sudden, this Japanese guy appears on the beach in Maui, and says, Tom, I've been looking for you. I said, well, how did you find me? And he said, your secretary told me where you were, and I'm here, and you've got to come to Japan with me. And I said, well, why do I want to do that? I'm on the beach here with my wife and children. He said, no, no, you've got to come to Japan with me. Look at 16-bit technology. Now, I had never seen 16-bit yeah. technology. This was the genesis. Yeah, so I went yeah. back to Japan with him. I saw it, and I fell in love, because it was so different. What do you different. say to your wife? I could imagine, because I can only imagine this conversation. Well, look, oh. the guy came all the way to Hawaii. We got to, uh, I got to. I'm only, it's only going to be a day. So he says, he says 20 hours. I'll be back in 20 hours. You know what? Hey, um, yeah. I'll tell you what. Um, there's a really nice jewelry store over there. Why don't you yeah. Um, yeah. put it on the room? My daughter saved yeah. me. Yeah. My little daughter was, um, she's my eldest daughter. She was about six then. 
and she, and this guy, he's trying to talk me into going and I'm resisting and she says, Daddy, you have to go with him. He came all the way here from Japan. You have to go back with him. And that saved me, so wow. I went. Yeah. yeah, and you have understanding family, that's great. And then, uh, so now you, then you, you, you're convinced, you see 16-bit and you're convinced. I am, yes. Yeah, and, and so then we get Joe Montana football, 121 points I score every night playing Joe Montana football you against the computer. Oh, I, and, and it was a lot of fun. I was yeah. addicted to this game, no joke. Yeah. And, and, and you, uh, what was the slogan? It was, uh, you can't do this on Nintendo. Yeah. And I loved my Nintendo, but I had yeah. to have a Genesis. Sega does what Nintendo don't, was the exact <laughs> end line on the commercials in the early days. And then it was Welcome to the Next Level. Yes. And then it was Sega, the screen oh, that we yeah. ended each commercial with. But the, the strategy, as you said, was to do lots of sports games. Yep. It was to lower the price of, of Genesis to $149. It was to put Sonic the Hedgehog in. It was to go after teens and college kids instead of little little kids. Right. And leave little kids to Nintendo, go after older kids for and, Sega. And I think you hit me at the right point because I, I was a big Nintendo guy, but I was growing out of Nintendo. A lot of yeah. the, you know, Tech Mobile was fun, uh, yeah. but a lot of the, th the, the games, I was outgrowing. I needed the next thing. Right. And you were, you were there. I remember just, I wanted this Sega so badly. And, and my parents didn't want me to have it because that meant buying all new games and spending yeah. $50 a cartridge. Right. Um, and I liked that the sports games were there. But what about Sonic? I, it took me a long time to wake, warm up to Sonic. I really didn't love that game in the beginning. And I, because I, I knew who the Mario Brothers were, but I didn't know who Sonic was. And it just, it seems so fantasy about it to me. Well, we, we built the Sonic yeah. brand much like we built toy brands in my past life. We did a Sonic television show. Uh, Sonic 1, I thought, was a pretty good game, but Sonic 2 was sen a sensational right. much better game. game. Yeah. We brought the team from Japan to the United States, and they worked with some of the U.S. guys down the street from our, our headquarters in Redwood City. And they built a great game. Did on this Sonic ever 2. get like super competitive between Nintendo's a Japanese company, Sega's a uh, Japanese company? You got there's Atari out there at the time. Everybody's trying to one up each other. Yeah. I'm sure you know Nintendo probably thought they were doing pretty good, and then you guys came out with the Genesis, and I imagine that it, there's got to be some competition. Oh, it was, it was ferocious. Yeah. It was absolutely ferocious. We we hated each other. Uh, we would uh, you go. We made fun of Nintendo in advertising. <laughs> we portrayed their machine as being for old, slow, little kids, and we were the hip, cool product. It was the original "I'm a Mac and I'm a PC" commercial. Yeah, it really was. Yeah, it really, it really was. And and we would do mall tours where we we introduced the Super NES before they did. We bought them in Japan, brought them to the U.S., and we'd go on mall tours and we'd show kids, teens and college kids. Here's Mario on Super NES. Here's Sonic on Genesis. Which do you think is better? And 85% of the kids picked us. You were brutal. Was this part of your plan? This was your idea? <laughs> well, it was my, my and my team. I encouraged aggressive marketing. I love it though. I love it. You just, like, you, you just put your foot on the gas and never lift it off. Yeah. We had kids on each college campus who were cool guys who played video games. Yeah. We'd give them a Genesis and we'd send them new software every month. And they all they had to do was go around campus and talk up Genesis. It was fantastic. Wh why did you come to my house? I didn't know you then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, what, what was the craziest thing you guys did publicity-wise to basically knock Nintendo off the pedestal they were on? Well, uh, one of the fun stories was yeah. Nintendo was so powerful yeah. that third-party developers were afraid to develop for Sega because they were afraid Nintendo sure. would punish them. Retailers were afraid that if they carried Genesis, uh, they wouldn't get enough Nintendo hardware or software. So Walmart, big Walmart, powerful company, they were afraid, it appeared anyways, to carry Sega. So they turned us down. And down the street in Bentonville, Arkansas, there was a strip mall. I opened a Genesis store, big sign, <laughs> said, come play Sega for free. Had lines of teen outside the door. I bought every billboard in and out of Bentonville on Highway 41 and, uh, and Highway 71. And uh, I bought all the radio and TV advertising, and I bought the seat cushions in the University of Arkansas football stadium down the, down the road. So when, you know, they hold up the seat cushions yeah. to make it say different things, different colors. On the other side, it said Sega. So across the stadium, you'd see Sega. Wow. And finally, I got this call from the vice president there saying, okay, we give up, we surrender, we'll, we'll, buy, we'll buy Sega. Wow. Yeah. That, it was that's fun. An amazing that story. was fun stuff. Wh what about uh, your favorite Sega game? Well, my favorite Sega game actually is Sonic 2. Really? I love Sonic 2. But I did like Joe Montana oh, football, too. I now, love now Joe you, Montana you, football. You have a, but you had like a personal connection to Joe, too. I've, I have a good relationship. How, first of all, how'd that happen? How'd you, obviously, Joe was like the big deal then, right? Well, but especially in San Francisco. But so how did, but how did you get Joe? I mean, 
back then, guys, there was no Madden. Guys didn't lend their names no. to games. No, well, actually it wasn't me. It was a guy who worked for me, contacted Joe and suggested that we may put him on the game. As it turned out, our kids were in the same school together. So our kids knew each other. And then I got to know Joe and his wife, Jennifer. And it turned out to be a terrific relationship. And Joe did, not only was he good at helping us design the football game, he did great commercials. He did. Yeah. Well, well, how come there's no Joe Montana football still for Sega? Because I'm not there anymore. Okay, I'll <laughs> buy that. I will buy that. Um, I, I, I could see that. I know that the, uh, there was this one thing where EA got uh, the rights to the NFL for 10 years. I think that's over now, but they literally locked down the NFL for 10 years. They did, which is, they did. And uh, they had uh, Madden weird. football yeah. and Madden. Uh, Madden. We Madden. originally outsold Madden football even yeah. after it was introduced. But uh, uh, eventually Madden became the well, and game. I, and I think the thing was for Sega too back then, you were trying to be a console company, not so much a game development company, really, because it was really about having other people make the titles, right? Well, we certainly wanted them. We wanted to get right. lots of third parties developing on our platform, but we tried to do a, a number of hit games ourselves, like Sonic 2, what like Echo Shining the Force Dolphin. What about Shining Force 2? Uh, ben says that was epic. Shining Force 2 was a great game, Yeah, great game. That was done by uh, our Japanese, uh, I think AM2 we called it, okay. the group that did it over there. Very, very cool stuff. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the gaming industry now, considering the fact that people are making millions of dollars playing video games professionally, people are playing it's video games on, on Twitch and on YouTube and yeah. making tons of money, game developers and, and creators are making tons of money, and uh, Kurt Schilling lost a fortune doing it. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of the industry and, and what it's become? Well, it's, it, to me, it's, it's, uh, I feel very blessed to have been part of it. Mm -hmm. I think we helped change it to older kids and college kids playing. I, when I left the company, the average age was 21 of the game players. Sony today says the, their average age is 31. The business grew, when I left it was a $7 billion industry, today it's a $63 billion industry. I'm very proud that I had something to do with, what, with what that. What do you think of the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One? I mean, I don't think those exist without Sega. Seriously, because they realistically everybody was, was very comfortable where they are, and then boom, you guys come out, now everybody's scrambling, you got to have Super Nintendo, you got to, everybody's got to step it up. The Neo Geo comes out, you have uh, Atari, uh, is make, trying to make a comeback 3DO, at that point. 3DO, stuff, yeah. 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 No, I, I agree with you. I think if we had not been successful in dethroning Nintendo, we actually passed them in revenue yeah. and, and market share for a period of time. If we had not been successful doing that, I don't know if Sony or the other guys would have had the, the stomach to enter the industry. And there really wasn't computer gaming like there is today at no. that point. I mean, I remember playing no. Wing Commander on this PC, but it wasn't yeah. like uh, that I had, but it wasn't yeah. like it, it is today. Yeah. Uh, Carmen, uh, Carmen San Diego was the big game on the, on the Commodore 64. Right, yeah. right. Uh, and, and, and so, w what about, uh, did you shake your head when Nintendo would come out with some titles? Were you ever like, oh, that's awful? Or, were you, or was there a time where you ever scared, like, oh my God, they really beat us on this title? You know, we, we obviously, even though we were highly competitive, yeah. we admired what they'd been able, sure. to, able to do. And, and after the, a while, we became somewhat friendly, although they were really good at dirty tricks. I mean, the, the whole uh, industry uh, Senate hearings against uh, the video game industry, that was actually started by Nintendo because they didn't like the fact that we were showing games that were more aggressive and had blood in them. Sure. And, uh, and, you know, more, we, were, we were after an older audience, they were after a younger audience. So there was the, that natural tension, if you will. So they, they were pretty good at dirty tricks in the, in, in the industry. But I admired what they were able to do with games. They, ter they did develop terrific games in large part. Every now and then they had a, they had a failure too. Was there ever a game that you said, oh my God, they, they got us beat, this game's unbelievable, they're going to sell a trillion of these? Well, probably the, the Donkey Kong, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about, you guys never had a power glove, you never had a gun for like a duck hunt gun or anything? I, that was the only thing to me that was really missing with Sega, with Genesis. Uh, well, we've tried different accessories yeah. from time to time, but accessories, in our experience, yeah. were not big hits. You know, we, they just, we were right. not that great at Today it's different, you got the Connect and all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. But what about, um, you know, uh, Sega Game Gear? Were you, were you part of that? Because sure. I loved my Game Gear, I had to have that. Uh, the, the only thing that was negative about the Game Gear, batteries. it was huge, and the batteries died way yeah. too fast. Yeah, that, I agree with you on that, and I loved Game Gear. Color LCD against oh, black great. and white Game Boy. Oh, we was, used to yeah. do commercials where we compared color against black and white. We, we had a commercial where we had what, a dog drinking out of the toilet. Wasn't that was my Airedale, by the way. And, 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 we, and we would say, well, you know, dogs are colorblind, so if you don't care about that, you 
you can play Game Game Boy. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. What about? Didn't you have one that said, "Do you want to play on the spinach green screen?" Or do you yes. Wanna, what, yes. Did, right? Wasn't yes. that? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I had a Game Gear. I loved it. I took it everywhere with me. It was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, Sonic came with that, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. Very cool. And then. So uh, you were at uh, Matchbox. We can't not talk about that for a second. Tell me about Matchbox and being there. I had every little car and the little wheel with the cars in it uh, and everything. Like I was, a ma I wanted Hot Wheels too. I wanted both. Yeah. I would never get Hot Wheels, but I had the Matchbox. And I remember going to the stores and getting the little box with the car in it. Yeah. Well, of course, when I was at Mattel, I worked yeah. on Hot Wheels as well. And so I loved diecast cars. And the Matchbox company had gotten into trouble in England. It was an English company, and they'd gone into receivership. And a friend of mine, David Ye, who was a Chinese manufacturer, very successful guy, had worked out an arrangement to buy the company and asked me to join him on that. So I joined him, and we helped. Companies are in receivership for a reason. There was a lot of issues. We restructured the whole company. We got it back on the right track. We made it profitable in the, in the UK, and then the rest of Europe, and then Australia, and finally the last market was the United States. Made it profitable, we had it public, and uh, it was the hardest three years of my life doing that, by the way. But I, I love diecast cars. We were doing them realistically. We made sure that every detail was accurate. We had a great collector business on it. But it was, it was an exhausting experience yeah. and we ended up selling the, the company eventually. I used to go to Jay's Stationery in Great Neck to get my Matchbox cars. Yep. And there was Big Top Toys that I would go to get my console games mm -hmm. on Long Island. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and I just loved the, the console gaming. Tell me about Console Wars, tell me about the book. Okay, so three years or so ago, the author, Blake Harris, contacted me here at Toy Fair and said, I want to do a book on the period of time that you were at Sega, 1990 to 1996,90, fighting against Nintendo. And I said, that's very interesting, Blake. There's probably 200 people in the world that care. And he said, no, no, you're wrong. There's all these guys who are really interested in that period of time and retro gaming is back. And eventually he convinced me. So Blake went out and interviewed 300 people. He interviewed Sega people, Nintendo people, the guys in Japan, our retailers, wow. consumers and put together a terrific story about that period of time. I, I think it sounds amazing. Uh, I got to get my hands on a copy. I got to read it. I think it should be a documentary, to be honest with you. I'd love the to hear these stories. The documentary's been shot. It has been. So the can we watch it? The documentary's been shot. How do we Not watch yet. it? The documentary's in final editing. Okay. Uh, I talked to Blake yesterday. I believe it's going to be available in the late spring. We got to have you back on to promote that. We got to watch that movie. I'm so, Console Wars is going to be a yep. documentary. And a feature so film is being made. A feature. Yeah. Wow, I mean it deserves it though. Seth, Seth Who Rogen, plays you? I don't know yet. Seth Rogen <laughs> and Evan Goldberg, you yeah. might have heard of them. Uh, Who? They did this movie called The Interview a little while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, oh, a lot of other I'm movies. I'm kidding, I know uh, who Seth Rogen is. And they're writing the script yeah. of the feature film. Uh, Scott Rudin, who That's produced great. Moneyball, sure. Social Network. The interview as well. And he's going he's gonna to produce he made, uh, the, big, the movie. Big, a big so he's going to distribute too, yeah. it. But like you, I would love to know who's going to play me. My daughters are hoping for Bradley Cooper. Really? Uh, that's not a bad uh, call. I could see. Well, we I have the same that. ab structure. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Maybe t 20 years ago. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Exactly. All right, and you're with Leapfrog now, which is I a am. lot of great stuff yeah. educationally for yes. kids. Talk about yeah. that a little bit. Yeah. So I, I left uh, uh, Sega in in '96. Uh, Why? I was Why? We missed you. Lots of reasons, but anyway, <laughs> I, I was hired. Is it in the movie in the book? <laughs> it is. Okay, great. It is. I was hired by uh, Mike Milken and Larry Ellison uh, to put together. A wait, company wait, wait. Michael Milken? Yeah, and Larry is Ellison. Is this the Michael Milken? And Oracle, Larry Ellison to put together okay. a company focused on education using technology to improve education. And we did 36 different companies over the next nine years. One of them was Leapfrog. Okay. I went in as CEO, and here's the deal. We're using video game technology and real education to make education more fun and interesting for young children. Teach them to get interested in reading and learn to read at a young age. Teach them to get interested in math at a young age, but make sure it's all fun. Yeah, look, my, my uh, son Jack is 21 months old. We were at Toys R Us, my wife and I, uh, last week, and she said we got to get him this Leapfrog stuff. She's showing me Great. the whole department on Leapfrog. Great. And this is not a joke, this is not a plug, this is serious. And, and we we're, we're sat there for 20 minutes uh, looking through all the stuff and picking some stuff out because it's about education and about having him be educational. Yeah. We want to get him, uh, he's already yeah. on our iPads and stuff, we want to get him off of that a little bit into yeah. more educational stuff. Right. I do like what you guys are doing and we want to talk more about that in the future as well. Your time has been amazing. I'm going to do something 
very special for somebody who's in the audience here. Uh, uh, Adam Holtz is, is a great guy. He's a great team member of Beat Terrific. He's a great producer. His brother Brian is here. He's been helping us produce. I want to bring Brian on. This guy, he's got to come on. He's got, I'm going to give him one question <laughs> okay. for you. He has been so excited for you to come. He has, listen, I don't even want to tell you, he had car trouble today. <laughs> he made it through car trouble. He says to help us produce. I think it was just to see you. So we got to come on. And there's a mic on the floor, Brian. When you walk in, you know the mic. Put the camera down, uh, except uh, for maybe somebody can take pictures of you. And Brian, I know he does not like these. These boys do not like going on camera. Watch the track. Go grab that mic. And uh, we'll get you on camera. <laughs> and we've got to get a question for you. You, you come right here, and uh, maybe um, uh, Adam can, can work that camera for you actually, to I, uh, widen the shot a little. Y you know, you explained a little bit um, to me before about the um, possible Sega-Sony collaboration yeah. um, earlier. I was just wondering if you could kind of explain the story or, you know, expand on it, you know, um, you know with the audience. Because, you know, you and I had spoken sure. about it a little bit. Sure. So b back in the in the mid '90s, we were working closely with Sony, and they were ju doing just they were learning how to do software in mm -hmm. those days, and we became very close. They had just recently gone through a bad relationship with Nintendo, so they were a little angry at Nintendo, which so of course helped us, and we started working closely together. We became very friendly. So one day we were talking about why don't we do the next hardware platform together, do a Sega Sony platform or call it Sony Sega didn't matter, and we'd do it together one hardware, because you generally lose money on hardware and sure. you make your money on the software. Yeah. And so it's we were better- It's the blade concept, right? Yeah, we were better at doing software than we were, so I thought this was the best deal in the world. And so our R&D guys anyways design, this agreed on a design. We go to Sony, and Sony says, yeah, it's a great idea, in Japan, it's a great idea, let's, let's do it. Go to Sega, and the Sega guys said, no. Why should we help Sony? And honestly, I thought this was the dumbest business decision yeah. in my lifetime. Because imagine what today could have been. It could have been Sega, Sony, PlayStation. Yes. And it would be great hardware I am and about great this. software from, from Sega. And I'm dreaming about this, and I'm dreaming about a PSP that is a Game Gear PSP. <laughs> yeah, that oh. would be great. That would be terrific. Oh, All right, Brian, great question. Do you have one more for us? Come on, one more. One more, Brian. <laughs> Brian. 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 <laughs> That's it? One more? You want to ask it off camera? I'll translate it. He had so many before. We talked earlier. I know. So I, yeah, I answered a lot of his story? questions. Yeah, but I want the viewers to hear these great questions. This is why he wasn't supposed to talk to you off there. All right. Was there a, a question that he asked you or a story he got out of you? Because that's a great story that, that he got out of you that you, you can retell. Oh, my goodness. Oh, um, oh, the chipset stuff. Oh, the chipset stuff. Yeah. So, again, uh, I, you know, I wasn't crazy about the original specs for what became the Saturn. Yeah. And so I, I knew Jim Clark, who was then uh, chairman of Silicon Graphics in Silicon Valley. And he called me up one day and said, I got a great chipset that you're going to love. It's going to make a wonderful video game machine. A guy here named, named Jensen Wang designed it. That guy later founded NVIDIA, a famous <laughs> company. Uh, and, and so my guys went over and we looked at this chipset and we, we really thought it was great. And so we called the Sega hardware designers in Japan to come over and look at it because we thought it was a better chipset than frankly what was going into Saturn. And they come over and they look at it and they said, ah, it's too big, too big a chip, what have you, it'll cost too much. And so they rejected it. And so Jim asked me, he said, well, what do I do now? And I said, well, there's this other company in Seattle you might try selling it to. And that became the chipset that's in the N64. Wow, that's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. That was a very nice thing of you to do. Well, I like Jim. Yeah. <laughs> and I was and a little angry at Sega at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, you want to play a little slot car here? You like? You seem oh, like a guy who likes to have yeah, fun. Yeah, I do. So I do. I'll be the um, Which car inside car. I'm going to be the white car, I think. Uh, yeah. No, I'm the, uh, yeah, I'm the white car here. Yeah, okay. And no, I'll, I'll say three oh, and then okay. we'll go. Okay. And uh, while, while we do this, if we can get it going for a little while, yeah. uh, we'll talk a little bit. Uh, I have one last question for you. Okay. Uh, but I really appreciate your time and everything. All right. Here we go, you ready? Yep. Three, two, one. I guess we can't hit the turn at the same time. What the Maybe heck? Maybe Brian can reset this real quick. He won't be on camera, I promise that. What do you think of these stadiums? They're filling stadiums playing video games now. Is, well, is that just I, you blow know, your mind? The, I, the whole thing about Twitch TV, yeah. 65 million people watching others play video games, yeah. isn't that fantastic? It's unbelievable. Who would have, who would have thought of that? Uh, who would have, it's, yeah. it's right. Well, I'm also a partner at Al Sup Louie, Venture Capital, and we invested in that company. Very smart move. Yeah, early Very on. Very smart move. Very All right, here we go, three, right. two, one. 
And I'm the blue one now. Oh, oh we got the crossover for me. again. Oh, and the crossover. Sorry. All right. Well, it Enough was a lot of, of fun. Thank you for playing. Thank you for coming on. <laughs> Please stay in touch. Yep. We've got to have you on more. Yep. Terrific. All right. You Love like being the PlayStation? With you. Thank you. I do. We've got uh, PlayStation three at home we don't have four yet but do you, you like have, it and you uh, like xbox the xbox one. You, you're yeah. impressed by but what video games have become i i am i mean the yeah. graphics are incredible the yeah. play is incredible i still like sports games me too yeah i can't stop playing them and, and i'll take any sports game basketball i even like the 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 the, the snowboarding games all that stuff yeah yeah the basketball sensational yeah absolutely remember yeah. nba jam yes very yes. much so he's yeah. on fire we're going to break we'll be back with a whole lot more from your official Toy Fair live coverage, <laughs> Toy Fair 2015 at the Jacob K. Javits Center in New York City. I'm Michael Artis. My machine's the real thing. We'll be back on Be Terrific with a whole lot more right after this.